Hello, everyone. I'm Erica Johnson. I'm Director of Graduate Studies in the Curriculum of Global Studies. And we are honored, thrilled to have these three amazing students finishing our program this spring. Um, first, I congratulate all of you on your successes in the program. You have each contributed in such fabulous ways to cohort building, to classroom discussions, to establishing professional networks for the students and faculty in the program. So we are very thrilled to be able to have these Rotary students in our program. We thank the Rotarians and Rotary International for your investment in them. The impact is clear on the students, but it has ripple effects across our campuses. Um, I also congratulate you on these amazing presentations. Well done. Thank you for sharing your research with us and your professional experiences. Um, each of you are touching in various ways on migration experiences, in some ways very local and in some ways very global responses to these crises or trends. Um, the forces that cause the global migration to happen receiving countries' responses to them um, and international um, responses as well. Each of these is highlighting um, local, um, regional, national, and international intersections with peace, how we in, you know, accept migrants, what causes them to go into migration are all important questions connected with peace. So thank you for this great work. Um, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative to ask one question to all of you and give you each the chance to respond before opening to the audience. And my question is, you each are committed experts and professionals in these fields. You have worked on these topics prior to your program. You plan to go back to them. These are challenging, painful topics that you deal with. What have you learned during your time as a Rotary Peace Fellow? in your master's program that helps you stay motivated to work in these areas? We'll start with Scarlett and move down the line. That seems hard, Rika. Um, so, I mean, it's a fantastic question. Thank you, Erica. And I think that for um, a lot of us as Rotary Peace Fellows, we come into the program at sort of the mid-stage of our career, and we think we have a strong sense of knowing what we're interested in, what excites us, what moves us. Um, but the experience of spending two years in which you get to indulge your diverse interests in an academic setting with all this incredible stimulation, the opportunity to collaborate with one another and to benefit from the global experience that comes with being at both the University of North Carolina and also Duke um, is truly transformative. It enriches your ability to get to the uh, detail of what it is that excites you and moves you and why, and it gives you an enlightened perspective to be able to engage with multidimensionality. I think for me, as somebody who's fascinated by complexity and about how these things intersect um, and how we can make sure that a single decision doesn't have sort of cascading ramifications, uh, what I really gained out of this experience was the ability to not only think in this manner um, in a better way, but to actually be able to build something tangible and operational that can translate an abstract idea into something very real. And I hope to take that forwards in my career after I graduate. Thank you. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> the same. Um, I really relate to, the, to what, um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot her name, but the last video we saw, uh, alum our alumni said, about the option to see the forest rather than the trees. I think this is what the, this program has done for me, like that I feel most clearly and um, is that, that I got the opportunity to get out from the steaming kind of like mess and uh, look at it from the outside and um, take the time to really think and process what I'm going through right now so I can channel it to uh, find a better fit for myself moving forward. Um, and so that's, this is something that really I could not have um, allowed myself to do without the program. Also, 
in terms of gaining like practical skills, I think that the, um, the ability to think critically, which I developed um, uh, thanks to the Global Studies Program, and the, just the technical skills, learning you know how to speak about things that are so interesting to me in theoretic ways that I didn't know the word, didn't have the words for before, um, and then. The final thing is that through the program, I had the opportunity to take on language classes that I really wanted to take. Um, I studied throughout the fir my first year, I studied Arabic very intensively, and I really hope to take the, that skill back to work um, when I go back home in two months. So. Very quickly, because otherwise I will be repetitive, but the program for me um, was a way also to show the things that I was seeing in, in the first hand there in the field from a different perspective. So in a lot of classes, we were reading things from the academic perspective that I was seeing there. So this uh, having uh, our knowledge, because in the selection process, we have to prove that we had some kind of experience, but coming here and matching this field experience with the academic world it's something very valuable that was super clear, not only for me, but I, when I talked with my fellows, it was something also very valuable for them. So this is beside what I agree with them, that they said, this, um, the, the possibility to see the same issues, but with different facts, different researches, different perspectives, this is very, very valuable for me. Fabulous, thank you all. <laughs> um, we'll take questions from the audience. Anyone ready? Yes, please. Now, um, hey everybody, um, I'm Daniel Zavala from Venezuela um, and I'm loving like the uh, researches that you guys are working on because it's uh, similar a little bit to what I've been going through uh, as I've been a Venezuelan in the United States. Um, I, the question is for any of you, um, you guys that have been working together during these uh, couple of years and the research that you guys are making are pretty similar, working uh, to support immigrant and refugees. Are you guys uh, planning in the future to work together in order to support like immigrant uh, or refugees from anyone in the world? Anyone want to? Say it in Spanish, but like, sorry, to translate, like that would be a dream, right? But yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think one of the great things that Rotary does for us is the ability to really develop this network and create friendships that will last um, for life. And it's very, it would be amazing to, Come, like to have the opportunity to collaborate with each and every one um, of the people I met here. I, I heard in one class here, uh, one professor said, uh, as important as who is in front of you is who is by your side, because it's very likely that you're gonna meet these people in your future career somehow. So, um, like connections and uh, the possibility to network and today also being with with you it's also important and it's the advantage i suppose as well of all of us being young curious and ready to go anywhere that the adventure takes us it means that um over this amazing unpredictable journey the possibility of us being able to be based in the same place working in the same organizations partnering on similar initiatives it's certainly not an impossible uh, chance, which is very exciting indeed. And offer our apartments for people to sleep in when they yes. come visit our country. <laughs> Do we have an online question? Or there's a hand in the back. Yep, great. Can you explain why gender-based violence is a unique or uh, a good example of how to make your nexus take place in more comp complicated or, uh, um, say, international sorts of 
fix uh, situations? How much time do you have? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, yes, absolutely. I think for me the thing that is particularly exciting about gender-based violence is that we, as practitioners, work in a very principled manner. We're focused on the participatory approaches that Sakina was speaking about at the beginning of the day, really letting survivors sit in the driver's seat and guide the way that they want their healing to look, and then our responsibility is to build the enabling environment around them to do that. Um, additionally, what we're able to do is be governed by these principles, regardless of whether we're working in a humanitarian response, in a conflict setting, in a sustainable development program. And because of that portability across these pillars, you can maintain high quality standards that are really evidenced, um, empirically corroborated, but also really participatory. It also is worth noting that the gender-based violence sector has really emerged from civil rights movements and social justice movements. And so oftentimes feminist activism is sitting at the forefront of how policies and practices are shaped. It's by no means a perfect sector, as no sector is. It's something that is continually being refined and challenged as the world changes. However, as we're thinking about this nexus as an abstract concept that doesn't have any models in sort of a functional understanding that we can point to easily and identify. Gender-based violence offers us a blueprint. It's not everything that we need, but the idea is that we can use that to build something that lasts. Thank you. This one is for um, Gabrielle and Netta. Um, one of the things you both highlighted was the vulnerability of migrants who don't have uh, documentation or their status is unclear in the country that they arrive in. If that was, uh, would that be a game changer in terms of addressing a number of the other problems you've identified that migrants face and what would you need to do to get that to happen? Um. <laughs> Yes and no. Um, first of all, we all need to recognize when we imagine solutions, we need to recognize that the overall trend is going towards a more restrictive migration policies and not the opposite. So even if I want to see, um, and I do want to see a much more generous um, migration policy in Israel and in everywhere, um, this is not where reality is going. So when I was doing my research, what I was focusing on is finding um, additional, like not giving up on the demand to give status when I think the situation um, calls for that, but to also find complementing um, uh, mechanisms that would be able to improve the situation even if it's still far from ideal. And on the other side of things, we need to also recognize that even after, uh, in situations where people do get permanent status, do get citizenship, it doesn't suddenly make them not migrants. So like you can, you still carry on the, um, the difference, the, the um, language, the all, uh, many other challenges that you come with even if you get status. So even if the solution is status, it's not enough. Absolutely, it's not, absolutely it's not enough. Um, in my research, I got, I, I concluded that I realized that when they arrived in, in the specific environment that I was studying, that I'm studying, when they got there, um, they are very well protected, legally speaking. So in 2017, there was a law called Zampa Law, La Legge Zampa in Italy, that equiparated like, uh, minors, European minors and unaccompanied minors arriving, they were well protected. If the integration process works, it's another step, but the question was about legal status. So they cannot be expelled, they cannot be sent back, they have to be received. The problem is when they turn 18, and there is, a lot of research on this, this 18th birthday uh, because they change their legal status and they change the umbrella and they change their protection. They change from uh, an environment, an umbrella, a legal framework that 
recognize that they have rights because they are human beings, okay? You have access to health, you have education, home, and then in, tomorrow, they don't. So, and this is the first step. How could we find a job? Oh, in the interviews, I asked them also, oh, what's your, are you working, did you work? And, that? and all, of, all of them, they said, well, there was an inverse causality. So, I thought in my research that having documents would help them to find, to have better uh, labor market outcomes. But in their situation, given the situation that they are and the laws that are changing all the time there, having the job helped them to find documents, to have documents, because when they turn it in or when they have to renew documents that doesn't exist anymore, they can ask, oh, but I will change my uh, childhood permit or my uh, humanitarian visa to work visa. So yes, documentation helped them to find a job. But in that specific situation, having a job is helping them to find the document. Understand? So um, it's not the only important thing, but perhaps it's the first important thing to exist, to recognize. Okay, you are here because of this. And just to, to be very quick, when I, I show you my story, and that's real, okay? Um, and I got the Italian citizenship, and I had a very uh, ethical crisis inside my heart when I was applying for the citizenship. Because just because I had three or four pieces of paper that someone escaped from Italy 120 years ago, I became a citizen. I'm not telling you I have a visa. I became a citizen. I can't vote. I have to go to the war. <laughs> I became a citizen in Italy. And in my street there in Italy where I used to work, there was a Sri Lanka person that that's, lives in Italy for 20 years. This guy had the whole family there, raised their kids there, raised his kids there, give job for other three, four, because he has a, a, a market, a small market, groceries, pay taxes there, and every year this guy has to go there and to renew the visa. Because there's a difference that the, the you sanguis and you solis. It's because of your blood or because the ground, you know? So it's more or less a mother that has two kids, one that was born from her and another one that was adopted. May we say that just the first one is her kid and the second one not? I don't think so. We have a question in the front. Zambian. If Brazil and Italy, please, I don't know. But I, <laughs> but I prefer Brazil because Brazil is going to the World Cup and Italy is not going. Sorry, Thailand again. <laughs> Am I on? So my question is short. Uh, I like all of you, especially the one that talk extemporaneously without script. Good job. So no one, I was thinking about the cost of all this, a deeper cost as a social scientist. I thought maybe the deeper cost is maybe not materialism. Maybe it's just because I wasn't, I, I'm an immigrant from the Philippines. Because I moved, people move just out of desire for something new. Not necessarily, because some of the people that moved were well-to-do. Just, just the drive for something new that everybody does, right? And then the solution, I was thinking, can we just develop the countries where they are from so that they don't have to move? Thank you. Anybody ready for that I one? Will, I was willing. <laughs> that someone would do this question? <laughs> well, um, the academia is full of uh, researchers that development, in the beginning, it's a push factor because they have more money to travel. Those who travel is not, uh, let me be correct with the word, those who travel is not the poor, poor, poor people because they cannot escape. They, they don't have means to get out. So when you start develop a country, there is a, a beginning of 
rising in the development. For sure, this is a good solution in the long term. But until this happens, the people are still coming, and the people are still dying in the ocean. The people are still dying in, 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 in centers in El Paso, like you saw the last week. So there is a long policy that perhaps we can tackle. But there is another thing Simon mentioned in his presentation. The aging in developing countries are much bigger. So to make something sh long, short, our developed societies are getting older. We are living more. Women are getting children, less children, later. So um, there is a, we have to look also not only the push factor, but the pull factors. Why they are going in this direction? Just to give, to be sustainable, we have to have 2.1 children per women in developed societies. In US, it's 1.6. In Europe, it's 1.5. In Sahel area, it's 5.04. Yeah. And the aging, like the life expectancy, in US is 82, and in Sahel area, is 62. So they have four kids more, and they live 20 years less. UK get out, UK get out of European Union, and after three years there was lack of truck drivers there. So for even if you don't care about humanitarian things, no, I don't care, that's not important. But there's an economic discussion on that. Migration, it's necessary to pay our pensions. But this is a big discussion, and we can stay the whole afternoon here. I'm so sorry. I don't want to big bring numbers, numbers, but it's important also. Scarlett or Netta, do you want to respond? Maybe just to add on to that, I, I'm not sure necessarily about like the trajectories of development, but obviously supporting development is um, something that can be used as a positive or negative incentive in foreign countries for people to either relocate to go there or to remain there um, with varying results. Uh, as we've seen, even just under the present administration of the United States, there's been a big impetus to try and support Central American development um, as a way of incentivizing people to want to remain in those countries rather than to, to migrate to others. Um, and I recognize that this is quite a contentious issue and that it's early enough in the policy implementation that we can't see how the results are going to look just yet. Um, but I think that when we come back to the critical components that people's migratory capacity is influenced by a multiplicity of factors, because of course it can't be simple, um, or it wouldn't be me saying it, um, <laughs> that you need to recognize that that can be a, a mixture of incentives. And we all have the privilege of being here under uh, student visas, which enables us to have access to a very different lived experience than a lot of other people who come to the United States. Likewise, you know, when it comes to moving around, as you mentioned, I've had the privilege of living in a variety of different countries because I have had the whim to up and go. And that didn't mean that my contribution to that country was any more or any less than somebody else. So even if the reason is simply for somebody to experience a potential better quality of life, um, taking into consideration Gabriel's, um, Gabriel's data that he just shared, we need to consider the fact that migration is something that is very healthy for not only um, sending countries, but also for receiving countries. And that gives us an understanding of development, not in a geographic or geopolitical way, but in a transnational community way. I, um, one more thing I wanted to add is that um, it seems like migration in the, is this very big trend, but we need to keep in mind that the vast majority of people do not migrate. The vast majority of people in the world live in the same country they were born in. I think it's the last uh, statistic is only 3.5% of the world populations are, are migrants. So while it is a significant problem, it has a lot of consequences. We talked about some of them. It's still a, a, a significant minority. Um, yes, please. Hello. Um, so I thought all of your presentations were fantastic. Um, and 
the part that I found most interesting was the developmental programs you guys talked about to combat women undergoing uh, gender-based violence and women and children um, during migration. And so my question is, what do you think is the most tenacious challenge you might face while implementing such a program um, and developing it and implementing it? Ooh, I love this question. There's so many ways to slice it. Um, I suppose it depends on your perspective, right? If you're operating in a country that is not yours, you need to be constantly making sure that you are contextually appropriate and that you are really using and centering that local knowledge. Sometimes in the international sector, we disproportionately attribute value to generic, technical, specialized master's degree knowledge, um, rather than an understanding of the subtle factors that exist in a community or in a society. And so taking that into account as you're designing or implementing a program is really critical to ensure that you are not coming in with, as Simon was describing in his earlier panel, the arrogance of somebody who has this colonial sort of idea of what this community needs and then the initiative falls on its face because you haven't taken into consideration very, very small things. And I think throughout the course of the Global Studies MA, we really benefit from that critical analysis of what has worked and what for all intents and purposes should have, but just didn't, and why? Like, let's try and work backwards from this very unexpected outcome. So I would say that that's a really important consideration. Another is making sure that you're really engaging with um, those indices of uh, how people move through the world. A, a program can't meet um, a heterogeneous group in a homogenous way. So if you're speaking about migrants, Gabriel took great care to talk about different ages. Netta took great care to talk about gender and alluded to you know, countries of origin and things. And all of those things shape how you need to be thinking about your intervention, not only to mitigate the potential for harm, but additionally to make sure that what you're doing is effective and useful and wanted by the people that you purport to serve. Thank you. Build on that, I think that one of the most important things is to understand that your actions have results that you don't necessarily expect or intended. So for example, I don't think that host countries or destination countries around the world created um, a spousal-based visa application that will purposely endanger women. No, but the fact is that it builds on certain gender dynamics and gender roles that enabled this reality. So it's about um, understanding the, the unintended uh, results of your action. No contribution. I, <laughs> I just agree. They are the experts on that. And I had one last thing. Sorry, I got so excited by what you said. I just wanted to build on it very quickly. So in my presentation, I alluded to briefly the idea of engaging with the development of a compound vulnerability in instrument that allows us to look at exactly what Netta is saying. So just because your harmful consequences were unintended, it makes them no less harmful. So anticipating that and mitigating those conditions is one way to do it. But And we have mechanisms, we have contextual analyses, we have humanitarian needs analysis, we have conflict analysis models. But putting them all into conversation with one another and then considering unintended and intended outcomes, I think there's still so much more that we can do from that um, and build upon that monitoring and learning that Simon spoke about earlier. Thank you all for your questions. Please help me congratulate our fellows. <laughs>